Searching for you here for so long, so long. And what is up, everybody? It's your boy Blake Money, Blake Weather. Welcome to another episode, Unfiltered Bachelor. I am your Unfiltered Bachelor, Blake Money, Blake Weather. Hi, how you doing? How's everybody doing? Uh, t- today. My is I'm not joined by my co-host Ian, and he is handling business. He's doing his own thing, and that's okay because we like to have guests, and sometimes we like to have guests from the far reaches of the universe. And in this case, from Australia, is that right, George? Yep, absolutely. What part of Australia? Melbourne. 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 What Australia. Say, what do you guys say? Melbourne. M- Melbourne. Yeah, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, of horror show though. You know horror show, the hip hop group. Oh yeah, so like yeah, a, yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan, so I've been listening to them a lot lately. So I've been landing had pronounced Melbourne, Melbourne, <laughs> Australia. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's better than my American accent, that's for sure. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by George. George, pronounce your last name for me because I don't know if I can. Honestly, I just make it easy and say George Katz. George nice Katz. and sharp, you know, like George. That's my that's my stage name. <laughs> I was going to say Muddy Blake Brothers is my stage name, but they call me that in the streets too. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my man, how you doing, bro? I'm good. I'm really good, man. It's the start of the day here. You know, we're in okay. I'm basically in the future. You're still in the past. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you and this the future's looking good, man. The future's looking good. <laughs> uh, yeah, and people are somewhere in, in the middle, huh? Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, George, so I met you just to kind of do this roundabout. I met you through one of the the online groups, online men groups that mm-hmm. Steve Maeda has, has set up. Mm-hmm. We kind of clicked. We kind of became friends. You've got your own group. You've got your own thing. Kind of introduce yourself to people who don't know what the hell George Katz, the, George Katz does. Sure. So it's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, as you said, we connected. I think it's mostly because... We both got a passion for MMA, <laughs> and martial arts, so we connected on that level. And guys are like that, you know. As soon as there's one mm-hmm. thing that you're both into, you're just like BFFs you, for life. You 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 bro out, yeah. We're yeah. like, we just become best friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, we met in Steve Maeda's group and um, my group in particular. So what I do is I, I'm essentially a dating and relationship coach, but I specialize on the internal work, the psychology necessary, and uh, Hopefully, in our discussion today, I'll be able to tell you why that's important. My group's called the Integral Alpha. And the idea of the Integral Alpha is reclaiming what it means to be an alpha and doing it from a place of integrity. So, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I like that. I like that. And, yes, to touch on, I think lately, I've did, like we, we, we kind of talked on – psychology factor of it the the in once you're once you're past the whole dating and once you're past the whole uh you know hey can can i get your phone number hey can we go on a date type thing like yeah. what's that transition like right what's the psychology what's the mindset what and like that's something i've really ran into pretty recently man like um and i discovered my actually my co-host through my co-host who bought the book attached like yeah, that's been book. a book like yeah, that's been a book we've been like talking about. Like we talked about it in the last episode, or the last two episodes actually. And um, but it's and it couldn't have come at a better time, man. I always say, like, you know what, man? Like, universe is fucking crazy, bro. You know, some shit just comes and it hits you right when the fucking when it needs to happen, man. Perfect mm. example I'm gonna give you. Uh, so I was dating this girl. We've been on and off, kind of like we're still seeing other people, whatever. Still trying to figure out our own ways. We decide to be exclusive, and that lasts all of six days. <laughs> um, but it's because it's, I just laugh, man. Because and then and that shit you do in high school, middle school, you know, six, six day old relationships and shit. But anyways, <laughs> I, I digress. Um, but I happened to, yeah, I was, and I was left a little bit wondering, like, why? Like, what the fuck? What the hell's going on? You know, I thought everything was peachy keen, a okay. You know what I mean? And Earlier that day, 
my co-host had forced me to order the book. He's like, I'm not going to start this podcast with you until you go to Amazon in front of me and order this goddamn book. So I, I ordered it. So needless to say, I was waiting for it. And I'd kind of watched some light videos on, on attachment theory, right? On like YouTube and seen some articles and stuff. So Tuesday comes, I get it at night. I didn't even read it. But Wednesday, I couldn't put the fucking book down, dude. Like I read like five chapters, just like, like just like ran through. Like I, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And all of this shit like started like making sense. And it couldn't have come again at a better time. Like my, my, my co-host couldn't have told me about the book at a better time. I couldn't have gotten the book at a better time if you asked me. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you do those things. Oh, I wish I would have had it a week earlier. I wish I had a year early. Whatever, whatever, right? But like I got it when I got it. Mm-hmm. And like shit just made sense about, in this case, other people you date. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it just and, – and like to kind of sum it up, like she's an avoidant and I'm more of an anxious, secure and that don't, hey, that don't always make for good coupling right there, George. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's probably a good idea to get audience up to scratch on what we're talking about. Um, in terms yes. Of- Sorry. That was, a lot, that was a lot to take in all at once, huh? Y- yeah. Uh- <laughs> Just, I think, I know, I know we're talking the same language, but to other people, we're probably speaking Japanese for all they know. Um, yeah. So do you want to kind of share what, you know, what so- you know about it? And then we, I'll, I'll kind of share what I know. Right. So lightly, like, and I'll just read, like, if somebody were to go on Amazon and read the back of the book, I mean, really what it, what it dives into is based on our childhood, we, we formulate these attachment styles as we grow up, not just with relationships, even though that's where it kind of, I think, highlights our attachment style does, but our interpersonal relationships with people, right? Uh, and how we handle um, problems and how we feel comfortable i think processing um our our relationships just just again in general with people and again it comes out in in dating and in relationships and so the three there, there's the there's four styles kind of is what it breaks down to but the three big ones are anxious avoidant and secure and and it has a quiz in the book and you can kind of take it to kind of find your own style but just to kind of uh catch people up Um, And this is, again, from the back of the book. Anxious people are often preoccupied with their relationships and tend to worry about their partner's ability to love them back. Avoidant people equate intimacy with a loss of independence and constantly try to minimize closeness. Secure people feel comfortable with intimacy and are usually warm and loving. So it's it's not the the full description, right? But it's kind of the, the, the nutshell version of like what each style is. And people, as they hear that, probably like, oh, I knew somebody like this or, Oh man, that's, that's kind of me. Right. So that's kind of my, I I think encapsulating thought to kind of my introductory thought for people as they go into this conversation with us. I don't know. Is there anything else I'm, I'm missing or like uh, anything you'd like to add, George? Well, it's a very deep topic and I, and I, (laughs) I don't, I don't like for a second pretend to be an expert in it. I have a peer who is a psychologist who, who, it's leaps and bounds more of an expert in this field, but it is an important one to understand. And it's actually not something new. The, this has been around since the 1950s. John Bowlby um, theorized this whole idea of attachment. He's, he was yeah. talking about essentially evolutionary strategies that had developed um, mm-hmm. to keep us safe in, in certain stressful environments and different environments. And, and that these, ways of attaching to our to our parents um kept us alive and then they basically yeah. did this these experiment experiments starting with what's called the strange situation experiment and they learned about these styles that you mentioned um there's some different schools of thought on those styles and the intricacies of that but i guess the most important part is to understand that your attachment is essentially got to do with how you feel cared for, how you feel loved, and how you deal with reparation, repair. So what, how, how do you feel about when there's conflict or uh, separation and how you deal right. with that? And it's those three components that then show up in our relationships because they happen, right? So maybe this person doesn't love you the way that you want or you get into conflict with them 
or um, the way that they care for you isn't the way you want to be cared for. Maybe you want lots of attention and so forth. So if we're not aware of these things, we don't recognize how they play out in our relationships. And then what happens is, especially with a lot of the perspective of the dating material out there is that we can have anyone. And if we just act <laughs> and we just do X, Y, Z, that girl will like us and that will be attracted to us. And what that doesn't account for is the fact that, well, some of the fucking time when people aren't into you, it's because their own shit is coming up and yes, it's incompatible. And the idea of attachment is twofold. It's one for you to understand yourself and how you show up in your relationships. And two, it's so that you can take what's potentially a dysfunctional relationship between you and a part and a potential partner mm -hmm. and not let the fact that you have these different attachment styles be the reason why the relationship falls apart it allows That's you to go okay this is why i'm doing this this is why you're doing this and from a mature perspective to go all right let's fucking how can we work yeah how, how can, can we, we work, work through this, this bitch exactly yeah. exactly and that's where the awareness of it becomes important because just to give a sort of a quick, quick uh, point of view on this in terms of the attachment styles, an avoidant is somebody who's going to distance themselves. They're going to be more emotionally unavailable and they're going to be, be triggered. They're going to be reactive to any feeling of engulfment. And engulfment is the idea that this other person is trying to consume them. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's not, even if it's not a, 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 like a, if in reality, it's not a consuming thing, like maybe you text them a couple of times, right. And you're like saying sweet things or just want to see them or whatever, depending on their, how avoidant they are, they might take that as, oh shit, this person is trying to engulf me. They're trying to like take away all my freedom, all my autonomy. Right. Yeah. Right. And that triggers their attachment style, which is then to push away distance themselves uh, and potentially to, to self-sabotage the situation. And then the anxious, as an example, they, they cling on, they cling on and they try to hold on and um, they're afraid of any kind of separation. So you can see how this becomes not only a dysfunctional pattern, but it's kind of like this, this really fucked up sort of uh, <laughs> attraction that happens between yes. the sides, you know? So you find a lot of, uh, you can find a lot of avoidance in it and anxious being attracted to each other. And if you look at a lot of the, um, the dating material out there, a lot of it is to teach you how to be an avoidant. Yeah. Yeah. I was just talking about this on the last episode that I haven't released yet, but I was just talking about this with my co-host. I was like, bro, like one thing I discovered reading this book is yeah, this, you know, dating if you, as i was like as i go you know i did my own thing before before kind of coming into the world again of dating coaches and and, and stuff like that and dating advice right like because i was just kind of clinging to stuff that i remembered previously back in the pickup days man back when i was like 20 21 right and so i was using that you know early on in my dating when i was doing you know online dating and stuff like that but as i as I think about it and as I learn and as I, as I was seeing this kind of pattern, it was like, Oh shit, the stuff that like dating coaches and dating advice and all this dating stuff, it's teaching a person to put a, an avoidant facade over their attachment style. And then what happens is once you get comfortable enough and you realize like, Oh, they like me for me. So now I can bleh, drop that veil and Hey, Here's who I am. And like, and sometimes for some people, and I think especially for avoidance, it's like, oh shit, that's who you are. Hey, I got to go right now. Peace. You know what I mean? And then you're left in a situation. I, and I make, think wholeheartedly, I describe kind of my situation almost to a T because um, I think that's exactly what happened. And then that's exactly why I was left. Like, I'm not like, and it's exactly like you said, like it doesn't come from a place of malintent. It doesn't come from a place of like trying to like, engulf the person it's just like oh we're, we're going steady okay so here's the new normal right we we're gonna see each other and we're gonna when we hang out we're gonna hang out and like you know probably sex will be involved and like you know 
I, I like a certain amount of intimacy at this point. And this is who I am. And you're comfortable with it, right? Because you already like me. But for I think for the avoidant at that point, they're like, oh, my God, that, this is damn. They're not like an avoidant. They don't have avoidant tendencies. Like, oh, shit. This is mm, gotta go. coming on. Mm, gotta go. Me. Yeah. This is coming on to me too, too quickly. This is getting too real, whatever it might be. And I mean, it's really, it's actually a really saving grace that that happens straight away because what mature people do in that situation is to find out more information and to go, well, what's going on here? And how, like, what is it this person needs rather than, oh, this person's acting this way. Oh, they, they obviously, you know, want more than I want or they're moving too fast. Instead of projecting, which is what that is, is projecting. Bingo. Right? They would be like, hey, this is how, this is what I need and this is how I am and this is, and then you'd be like, oh, well, this is how I am and this is what I need. How do we make this work? And that's called maturity. And that's what maturity right. is, Right. So and, that's what we tried, and, that's, and I like that's what the book does too, right? Like uh, it does to do a point like, okay, if you want to be with this person, here's how, here's some ideas of how to work through it, how to manage your style, how to understand, understand their style. And I think that that's what, that's, that's the important part of why I could have put this down. Cause I wanted to understand me. I wanted to understand the other person's attachment style. And then I wanted to understand like, okay, what, I mean, we, we may never talk again, but just so this doesn't happen again, because apparently I went, I, again, man, I think a lot. I went through like my previous like relationships or previous like girls, like I've dated where I was like, I actually feel something here. Hey man, guess, Hey, you want to know, you want to know what the trend is, George? What's that? Guess what they all are. Guess what they all are. Avoidant. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I don't want to fall into that pattern, you know, and I don't know. Continue, man. Well, that brings up an, another interesting point, which is about the love aspect, because something I talk about in the book that I'm writing at the moment, it's still in the process, but um, something I learned from a lady that I've actually become, become, she's become somewhat of a friend and she's an expert in borderline dynamics, in particular, uh, Shari Schreiber. She was talking, she has this beautiful quote and I'm, I'm going to do a terrible job here, but her quote is basically that, no, like very few of us have experienced real love and real love, like Ooh. true love is a constant. It never creates fear. It never creates anxiety. It never creates uncertainty. It's constant. It's available. It's secure. It's safe. Like very few of us have experienced that. And why that's important is because in the book, I talk about three faces of love and the three faces of love, are true love, which we just kind of described longing, so longing is the kind of love that you feel when you, when what's drawing you to that person is a sense of like this void that you're trying to shorten. Mm -hmm. It's like the more that person doesn't take an interest in you, the more you feel that longing, the more you think you're in love with that person because okay. they're like that. Right. And it's that longing that is attracting you to that person. And if you're an anxious, if you're highly anxious or whatever, and they're avoidant, what you're being attracted to and what what is the gap between you is that longing that's what you find that's what you equate with love Woo. god damn george breaking me down baby <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the equation of loves and you see this pattern with a lot of guys because what they say is things like oh she she's not responding to me oh she goes quiet oh there's silence in, our, in, in the interaction or whatever, and they panic and they panic because what's, tra what's attracting them to this girl is the fact that she's not engaging with them. It's the fact that mm -hmm. she's actually being distant with them that they're attracted to. They go, oh, that's, that's, how, like, that's my impression of what love is. That's what I want. And then it's that same longing that causes them the, the agony and that agony makes them fall in love even more. Because like they want what they can't have kind of thing. And that's the longing yeah. kind of love. That's the longing kind of love. And, and generally that's tied to some things like emotional neglect and some other things that, that you might've experienced as a child. They, mm -hmm. That's how you found, that's your pattern of love. That's how you came. Right. To that's, 
right? and so I came to understand love at that point. Yeah, exactly. And and you need, and it's about recognizing that because um I don't know where this idea kind of started, but a lot of people have this idea that if there's a really strong pull with this other person, if I'm really into this person from like the first minute I see them, that's the person I should be in a relationship with. That's the person I should like, you know, spend the rest of my life with. Oh my like god, a love at first sight type shit. What, whatever it is, like if it's love at first sight, that's like super intense. But even that intensity, <laughs> that intensity is telling me is like a warning sign. Because what that intensity mm. is telling you is that what you're attracted to in this person, because you know them for about two minutes. So you don't know <laughs> shit, right? <laughs> so how are you having such an emotional, oh, it's, it's, it's my soulmate. No, right. that's not your soulmate. That's a person who is for whatever reason, your unconscious brain is measuring them up and they're, they're reminding you of the qualities that you experienced in early childhood. And it's that familiarity with that, whatever it is that that person's doing in subtle ways that reminds you of that early childhood that makes you feel like, oh my God, that's home. That's home. I remember that. I remember that. That was, that was back here. Like that is home. That feels like home. And then, Damn. and then you chase after that. And I would love, I would love to say that this is my theory, but it actually comes from um, Helen Harville Hendricks, who invented uh, a form of, it's a form of therapy specifically for for relationships, which is called the Imago therapy. And your Imago is basically your blueprint. It's basically this image you create of your ideal partner, or your ideal soulmate quote unquote that is represented by the good and bad qualities in your parents or whoever raised you and Mm. it's your unconscious blueprint when it sees somebody on the outside that seems to match up with that that internal representation it goes oh my god i'm that person's amazing that's the person i need and i'm in love with that's the person i need to be in relationship with and that is a fucking alarm bell. Not because you can't have a relationship with this person. Not because you can't. Because you can absolutely can. And very much so, most of the people you're going to meet in your life are going to have baggage. That's just a fucking mm-hmm. reality. But it's, a, it's an alarm bell because when you say, this is meant to be, this is my soulmate, this is the person I'm meant to be with at all costs, now you're not willing to actually put in the work or not willing to walk away if the situation's bad, not willing to communicate because this is like the golden prize that you don't think you deserve anyway. And now it's like the golden prize is here. If I get this golden prize, I have to hold on to it, latch onto it, keep it in my life under all circumstances. And that does not allow for a real relationship. Mm-hmm. doesn't allow for any kind of communication doesn't allow for any kind of growth and it pedestalizes the relationship as like the saving grace of the sh- your shitty life like without this relationship my whole life is shit right? yeah Fuck. You can't be in a healthy place if you if you if you're acting that way you just can't and man that's so real all the dating skills in the world, no matter how many people you can attract, isn't going to change when you see somebody who fits that blueprint. And I can prove that to you because look at some of the best PUAs. What's happened is they've gone with lots of girls. Then one of these girls has been that girl that they're like is different from all the other girls. And all of a sudden they've fallen back into their old patterns, what they were like before they were pickup artists. And then that girl re-triggers that pattern and that pain. And then instead of looking at that and going, okay, well, maybe I need to like look at myself and look at what's going on. It becomes, ah, oh, women are toxic. Women are evil. And then, then you get shit like the red pill, which says, oh, this is why women are toxic. This is why women are evil. This is why you, women are acting this way. And this is what you do about it. And all it is, is it becomes a way of, avoiding that pain by blaming and by seeing women as the enemy, right? Like Mm -hmm. uh, women are the enemy. I'm going to, then I'm going to learn all these power control games to play, to like 
play with them like puppets on a string so that I never have to get my heart hurt Broken. ever again. Yeah. But it doesn't work. Man, you know what that reminded me of as you were talking about that was uh, in the book, The Game, for those of y'all that read The Game. <laughs> I haven't read it in a few years, but it just reminded me of that, that scene with mystery and like the fucking Russian girl, the whole fucking gotcha. book, right? Like, yeah. gotcha, yeah. The one that just broke his heart like over and over and over. and it was he was up and down and up and down and yeah man like that that that's exactly what the fuck that reminded me of he fell back into like he wasn't mystery anymore he was Eric yeah right yeah. Like, he was he was that kid who wanted everything and and didn't know how to get it he wasn't the all powerful like I can get every girl type thing type shit. And yeah, man, I, I totally, I, I totally 100% relate to that. And I think the biggest thing that like I discovered, I mean, with all that said too, of course, is like, you can, you can, it's hard, but you can break the, the cycle of like, so again, over, over, we're kind of re recircle back to the attachment style. I, I, I very much read a lot of the anxious stuff. And was like, whoa, this is me. But then there was some stuff, again, in the characteristics they talk about. I'm like, maybe 10 years ago, that'd be me even more. But that's not me now. You know, like I do some secure shit now. So, for instance, I feel like if this happened to a high anxious person, if they're high on the spectrum, we'll, we'll say each style has a spectrum, right? If somebody high on the spectrum, if they go through a breakup or, you know, even like this, even if it's a short, short amount of whatever, whatever their initial reaction is to continue to reach out to this person who is favoring distance. Yeah. And that's been the hard, one of the hardest things is to revert not to my anxious style, but to my secure style and just say, fuck it. Like, just be cool. Like, wait, wait to hear back. And if you don't, you don't like, don't be anxious. Don't go out and like, don't send it. Don't send all these tech. Don't, don't do what old you would have done. Right you can change, you can cut the, but you have to want to, too. You have Absolutely. to want to un understand, you have to want to be better and you have to want to do things that I think progress you and um, are better for you. For instance, like what feels better for me to qualm, like, to kill the anxiety is working out. And I do, you know, I do MMA, I do kickboxing, man, and I love it. But that for me, every time I go into the gym, I like lose all, all sense of the anxiety. It's gone for, 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 for a brief bit longer than it would be if I didn't. Right. It's one coping mechanism. That's I think positive. And I don't think enough people, first of all, first of all, man, not enough people understand that goddamn self. I think they lose themselves when, when tra traumatic events happen, like they revert to like this, like, like you said, like they're the old ways. Mm -hmm. Like, what did I do to survive the trauma before? That's what helped me before, right? That's what helped me survive. So it's going to help me survive again, I suppose. You know what I mean? Instead of saying, oh, is, there, is there better ways? Is there better ways to do this that are more conducive and productive for me to take this negative energy and like make it positive? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of everybody's journey too, that you've, I forget who was talking. I think me and you were talking about this, right? Like you won't see that side of you until that shit comes out. Right. Until like you get into a shit moment. Yeah. And that's when the whack, -a whack a mole pops its head. It's like, Hey, I'm here. You remember me? Mm. And it's up to you to be like, yeah, I do. And it's up to you to make peace with it or be like, yeah, what did I do last time you were here? And that's, but that's one of the only points that you have to try and make it better. If not, and it disappears, the next time it comes back, you're just going to do the same thing. And it's just going to be the same. There's not going to be any sense of self. You don't, you have like a limited window, I guess is what I'm saying to work on that part of you before it disappears. And then the feelings that you had for whoever, whoever you're moved on to the next person. Yeah. I mean, does that make any sense? I don't know. Man. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, it's not that you have a limited window. You can always come back to that stuff. That's what a good coach or therapy or, grief work there's lots of processes lots of modalities that will help you go back there because you because what it speaks to is that you haven't addressed that but um i want to talk on the anxiety thing for a second because i think it's really important that people understand something 
a lot of us are accustomed to not feeling our feelings, Mm -hmm. especially feelings that are uncomfortable and anxiety is considered an uncomfortable feeling, but a feeling has never killed anyone. Okay. Facts. When you, when you, when you, for instance, feel anxiety and then you go to the gym, the reason you're doing that as an example is because you're afraid of the actions you'll take if you felt the anxiety because the anxiety then makes you take certain actions like texting, reaching out and doing silly Mm -hmm. things. And you don't want to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. The reality of that is the only reason you do that is because you want to alleviate the anxiety, Mm -hmm. but the anxiety is just anxiety. It's your judgment about what you're feeling and the fact that you're not accustomed to feeling it, that then you've come up with this way, this way of, of alleviating that feeling, which is I'm going to reach out, I'm going to do this and I'm going to try and solve this and whatever. Right. 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 Just be with the anxiety. Let yourself feel uncomfortable. Um, because the feeling is not going to last very long. And one of the things that keeps anxiety staying is actually not the anxiety. It's the resistance of it, which creates kind of a shame of feeling that way in the first place. So the thing about negative, like a lot of these like uncomfortable feelings is a part of being able to move forward in like beyond these feelings or not letting these feelings control us. Mm -hmm. So when guys think about being healthier, like individuals being healthier. They imagine some place where they never feel rejection. They're able to do whatever they want, like whatever behaviors they want. Everything's perfect. Nothing goes wrong. They're always happy. All this bullshit. One of the biggest indicators of emotional maturity is being able to fully embody the realization that just because you feel a certain way doesn't stop you from acting a particular way. So for instance, if I felt like shit today, it doesn't stop me from being able to jump on a podcast, talk to you and stuff, write, do my work, get my work done. By that same account, just because you feel something doesn't mean you have to act a certain way either. It's by it, the, the emotional immaturity of most people is essentially that they're accustomed to letting their feelings rule their choices. Makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, I'm anxious. What do I do to do? De- I don't want to feel anxious. I know I'll call her and I'll send a million texts. And it's like, it's okay to just fucking feel anxious. It will go away. It's, it's not permanent. Uh-huh. Your amygdala that when you are intensely in a state, whether it's anxiety or otherwise, you get a sense that this feeling will never end. Like Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like this forever. This anxiety and this like feeling is going to be this way forever. But feelings can't last very long. Even anxiety cannot last that long. And it's actually the attempt to like get away from it that causes the issues, which is why there's a, there's, um, there's about, a hundred different ways that you can approach this, but one of the simplest things for anyone to simply do is if you're feeling that anxiety or like that longing from a partner, maybe you got broken up with or whatever to actually just feel those feelings and be okay with what you're feeling. And that's, that's probably harder to, to kind of explain. Like it's a little bit hard to explain how to do that, but Essentially what it is, or a simple way to think about it is you can kind of just be observant of it and just be almost treated like a meditation where you're like, huh, there's like a tingly warm feeling in my stomach and it like expands out and then it like comes back in. And it's sort of like you're just noticing what you're experiencing rather than putting all this story on top of it. 
Right. Okay. And that gives you some separation. It allows you to just be okay with the feeling because like, like I said, no feeling has ever killed anyone. Mm -hmm. A feeling gives you a signpost for potential threat. Like there might be a real threat around you and that's why you feel anxious, but the feeling never actually killed anyone. That's true. That's facts. Okay. Man. George, we're getting deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is the, this is the work I do. This is the work I do. Um, but, this, is, yeah. this is crazy. Okay, I've never thought about it like that, obviously. I mean, I'm just, just you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing. I'm processing <laughs> while, I'm, yeah. while I'm, like, taking everything in. I'm, like, I'm supposed to say something here, though. But, um, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And. I think that that is a sense of, there is a sense of, I don't know if running away is the right word or anything like that, but it is a sense of like putting it off, putting off the emotion to yeah. to do something where you, you are like, I'm comfortable in the gym. Yeah. I gotta run that bitch. I'm in there. Hey man, I'm putting in work. I'm putting the numbers up. You know, I'm Jordan on game day. I'm over yeah. there. And that's when I walk out and, and it's, it creates a sense of confidence too for me. And it, and it, and it doesn't, you're right. Like no feeling lasts. Like, it, and that's what I was saying. Like it, it helps for quite a while until the next time I got to go back and I got to do it. I got to do yeah. it over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, God damn it, George, you're saying I got to make peace with this, with this anxiety shit, huh? Yeah. It's called, um, <laughs> it's called being anti-fragile in a sense. It's de- de- developing anti-fragility, which is, if you think of it like this, Every time you, you, you avoid the shadow, like literally a shadow on the wall, you see this shadow mm-hmm. and you're looking at it and you're like, fuck, it's like this monster and I'm afraid of it. I don't want to go towards it. Mm-hmm. Every time that you don't go towards it, the next time you see that shadow, it looks bigger because you stepped further away. So it gets bigger and, it, mm-hmm. and you keep stepping further away. It gets really big. Very big. Yeah. And it gets harder to go to step forward towards it. But the funny thing about a shadow is sometimes when you step forward towards it and you get really close to it, you realize it's just a bunch of clothes on a fucking stick. <laughs> Casting something that looks like a monster mm-hmm. when in actual fact it's, it's nothing and it's actually something that you can handle very easily. Man. God damn it, George. We keep getting, just when I thought we got deep, we got deeper, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and then this is all and, I, and i'm so selfish with well i guess i can be it's unfiltered batch i can be i can be selfish as i want to be and take your show, advice yeah. <laughs> yeah and and i think a lot of this applies to me but i'm sure i can't be the only one i'm sure i'm not the only one who's who's anxious i'm sure i'm not the only one who if somebody reads the the, the book and at least i think attempts to un, to to unveil the, 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 the attachment theory, because it, it mm-hmm. goes down like really what it is. It's all like childhood shit. It's all like childhood repressed memories or the way you handled, again, like I was saying earlier, like traumatic moments or how you process love, yeah. how your parents gave you love when either they did or they didn't or it's inconsistent or it was this or it's that. And uh, I, I read this, actually, I read this, uh, I'd like to share this with you. I was just thinking about this. So, you know, Facebook and shit, people send those funny memes and funny tweets and all that good shit. Mm. Uh, somebody, somebody shared this one. It was like some, somebody's funny tweet. And it was, uh, dating is really just finding someone whose parents fucked them up in a compatible way to how your parents fucked you up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, fuck, that's facts. <laughs> I'm like, that's literally attachment theory. <laughs> the thing about that is... The thing that stands out to me in that is that's that is dating. That is dating. Yeah. But the problem is, the problem is, dating is not rela- it, like is not a relationship. Right. So that meme has a lot of truth in it, but the part that makes the dating then become a relationship mm-hmm. is when you add to that meme and you say it's meeting someone whose parents fucked them up in a way that's complimentary. And now you're actually willing to do something about it. Oh, <laughs> next step right there. Right? That's the next step that people sometimes don't want to take or run away from or are not used to, or like, 
don't have the patience to deal with another person or so hey and sometimes they do and they're together for a thousand hundred years and they hate each other and they don't know why they love each other but they hate each other and they've well, that, never addressed that's that totally, shit. yeah that, that's totally <laughs> that's totally the same thing right it's like two sides of the same thing of i'm gonna be with this person and i'm still gonna fucking not i'm gonna ignore my shit and how it how it like adds more on top of this relationship than, than is necessary. But you know what? It's better than being alone with my shit. Mm-hmm. So fuck it. Even though this is destructive and drama and we hate each other after 50 years of being together and we don't even have sex anymore, at least I'm not alone with my shit. Right. Right. Just and that's that, goes, that goes back to, to the loneliness thing that you were saying, right? Longing? What was it? Longing. 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 Well, longing, loneliness... You know, I can talk about, oh, fuck, I can talk about the loneliness thing too. Um, yeah, it's about loneliness. Loneliness is a funny thing. I have some theories about it. One in particular is that, so, so there's actually two types of loneliness. There's like um, social isol- isolation, which is essentially you're not around people. Right. And then there's emotional loneliness. And the thing is like, you can be around people and still feel emotional loneliness. And that, that, that basically is this sense of like, I'm around other people, but I don't belong or I don't feel connected to other people or whatever it is. Right. And between these two different types of loneliness, you have four configurations. So you can have like, basically you have two versions. So say somebody who's just socially isolated, but not emotionally lonely. Somebody who's, just um, uh, is emotionally uh, not emotionally lonely, but he's socially isolated. So extremes mm-hmm. and then some combination of the two, basically, or sorry, the combination of the two and then one, which is neither. So you've got those four configurations, right? Right. The worst case, the worst one to have would be both that you feel emotionally lonely and you're socially isolated. Because you're basically not being around people and you don't even enjoy your own company. That's, that's the worst. The second worst would be the emotional loneliness, but you're not socially isolated. So that would be the, mm-hmm. the, the second worst scenario. The third worst scenario would be that you're emotionally good, but socially, um, you know, isolated, not around people. Yeah. And obviously the best case scenario is neither. Now, social isolation is a really simple thing to to resolve. It just means get to fuck around more people. And it's pretty simple. Get hobbies, do things, get in the presence of other people, be parts of communities. One of the appeals of churches and things like that is community. Community mm-hmm. is an important thing. Now, because more people these days are atheists and stuff like that, there's 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 less church, there's less community based things. Um, so we need to consider how we can create those kind of community based things that don't revolve around religion because people need community and community is important. And there's different ways for that. There's meetups and all kinds of shit, but that's an important part of it. And, um, so social isolation is actually something that, that it's an easy problem to solve. And, and if you're working on your dating life, like as scary as it is, if you're going to fucking complain day in, day out about the quality of online and how you're getting no success, but you're never going to open your mouth to somebody out in public, then tough titties. Like I don't have any sympathy for you. You're taking the easy route. So you're not, right. you don't get, it's a low risk, low reward place to be. So you're not getting the, re, you're not getting rewarded because you don't get to complain. Yeah, bitch. You don't get to complain that you're not meeting people. If you're just doing it that way, like shut up, like there's exactly. other routes. So go out, go out all routes. And then start to complain, maybe, if you're a complainer. Yeah, it's like you, you work at Macca's, but you're, a, you're complaining. Be- McDonald's, sorry. Macca's Aussie slang. You work at, you work at, Mac- you work at McDonald's and um, you're complaining because you don't own a you know, Lamborghini. Right. It's like, right, bitch, dude, get up and do something. Go get a better job. Go get a better job. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to bring this back to the emotional loneliness because that's really the component that most people – are hoping for when they like mm-hmm. long and grabs onto someone else, someone else as an answer. 
the, <laughs> okay, this is my theory. All right. And I, I have a fair bit of experience with people to know that there's some legs to it. Although I, it, it, it's a little bit complicated, but something Mark Manson said was, and he, and I think he said it pretty spot on was the measure of someone's self-worth is basically how they feel about the parts of themselves they don't like. Say that again. The measure of somebody's self-worth is directly related to how they feel about the parts of themselves they don't like. So if you don't like that you're tall and you, you're ashamed of that, right? That affects your self-worth, uh-huh. right? So the more you have aspects of yourself that you don't like and that you have shame about, the less self-worth you're going to have. Man, what, that's deep. <laughs> when, um, when you keep that in mind, loneliness, what loneliness is? Loneliness is the fear of being with the parts of ourselves that we're ashamed of. Fuck. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, man. So what you'll find is as you dr- address the things that you feel ashamed about yourself and whatever caused that shame in the first place, Mm -hmm. you become less lonely, which allows you to then do something that's very important and a part of being able to have a healthy relationship, which is called being alone. Because if you can't be alone, then you'll always be afraid of losing the person. And if you're always afraid of losing the person, you can't be vulnerable. You can't be honest. You can't be yourself. You can't have a genuine connection or relationship man that's true that's true so so that's it but well first let me, i've got so many things on my mind right now so first <laughs> what part of what part of this is your theory the framework about shame and how it ties to loneliness is is my theory. okay okay that's that's fucking genius first of all yes <laughs> So much yes on that, George. Um, yeah, man. So it, what's the repair process for something like that? Well, the simplest, the simplest answer to that is integrating the parts that you're ashamed of. Because the idea of being ashamed of a part is essentially it's kind of twofold. I guess the best way to put it is like a story. So I had a client once and he was out and he was talking to some girl and she's like, you only want to have, you just want to talk to me for sex. And he got really defensive and they got into an argument. (laughs) And um, he came to me and he said, ah, you know, this happened and I got upset and she's like, you just want me for sex. And I was like, no, I'm not like that. I, you know, I, I, I'm not like that. I, I talk to women and I want to know them and all this. And I said to him, man, just so full of shit. And he's like, yeah. excuse me? He's like, excuse me? What? I'm like, you're full of fucking shit. And he's looking at me and he's just dumbfounded and confused. And I go to him, dude, there's a part of you that just wants to fuck women. The fact that you're trying to pretend like that part doesn't exist. <coughs> excuse me. Mm-hmm. ignore it, avoid it, push it away. Right. Doesn't make it any less a part of you. And in fact, if you can't accept that part and welcome it into your family with all the other parts of you, it's going to show up in other ways. And what way does it show up in most men? Hmm, I don't know. The inability to flirt or touch a girl because they're afraid of being creepy. But why are they afraid of being creepy? Oh, because there's a part of them that is a sexual man that they're ashamed of. And that could be for a multitude of reasons. One, one of the most classic examples that probably a lot of people can relate to is if they had some traumatic experience, let's say they had a father that yelled at them, was angry at them, they, they might have internalized, I'm never going to be angry. Because being angry is, makes me like my dad. I don't want to be like my dad. So they go, that angry part, I'm going to shove that shit deep down and I'm never going to, I'm going to put a lid on that fucker and I'm never going to let it come out. 
Okay. Because I don't want to be dad and dad was angry. I actually had a part of me at one point that didn't want to make money because money was bad because the people I saw who made money were family members of mine who I didn't want to be like. So I, I equated making money with having to be like this, this person. Mm -hmm. And this is a person I never want to be. I don't want to be this person. But the thing, anger, money, whatever, that is just a vehicle. And for me to go, I'm not going to use that vehicle because this person's an asshole or this person isn't somebody I want to be is like saying, I'm not going to use a hammer because whenever I've seen people use hammers, they've bludgeoned people in the head with it. Not realizing that's just a bad use of that thing. That's just not how it should be used. Right. But there are better ways to use it because fuck knows you're going to see nails in your life and you're going to need to bang them in. And if you don't have a hammer, how the fuck are you going to do it? So it's that. It's that recognizing that every part of you, these parts that you're ashamed of, all this shit, they have a usefulness in some area or some part of your life. What's an example of this? Oh, I don't know. Let's say somebody's anxiety when they, when they think about going up to a girl. Guy has anxiety and he hates it. He's like, I fucking want to destroy this anxiety. I fucking hate anxiety. It's fucking ruining my life. First of all, fighting a part of you. Well, if I pushed on your shoulders right now, what's your reaction? If you, if you push, I'm going to want a bit. The fuck, gonna, man? I'm going to push back up. Right. So when you hear all these guys, I, I want to eliminate rejection. I want to eliminate re anxiety. I want to fucking destroy this part of me. They're just making it more difficult for that part to be resolved, to be healed, because they're pushing back against it and it pushes back. The anxiety, for whatever reason, right? Right now, let's say that there's this guy, we'll call him Steve. No, let's call him Jerry. All right, so we got Jerry. Jerry has anxiety when he goes up to women. Okay. His anxiety is because when he imagines going up to a woman and saying something, he sees this Fucking picture in his head, better production than any Hollywood film that he's that you've ever seen. Better graphics than Avatar. Better, more immersive experience than any of that shit. In his own mind, so it's nice and close to him. It's right in his psyche. Imagine a movie where they like mm -hmm. connect into your neural network. Um, and what he sees is a woman responding by laughing in his face putting him down, belittling him. Okay. Okay. That's the movie he sees. So he gets anxiety because when he, when he thinks about going up to this woman, he sees her belittling him, laughing in his face, making him feel completely shrunk as a man. So right? like, like shuts him down before he's ever going to get started. Right. So he has this movie in his head. It's connected to his neural network. It's like the greatest cinema ever created that's directly connected to his brain. Mm -hmm. And that causes this anxiety in him. And right now, he hates that anxiety. Right? Fucking Jerry. But, but if that anxiety wasn't there, how does he deal with the embarrassment? He, he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't, right? Right. Because he's yet to learn other ways, other tools, other ways to do it, to deal with the problem. So right now that anxiety is the best way for him to deal with this problem. Shit. So he wouldn't feel the other things that are necessary. Like the pain, the pain yeah, and the fact pain. that this, this person might do something that he has no way of stopping, of preventing, Re of rejection or acceptance. Yeah, whatever it might be. So what you, whatever you're experiencing right now is basically some part of you saying, this is the best tool and best way I know how currently to deal with what we're afraid will happen in this situation. Fuck. 
That's what, that goes back to t- attachment styles, bro. Oh, yeah. It's all inter- interrelated. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to make the whole goddamn thing about attachment stuff, but like a lot of these things are interlinked in, in to that. 100%. Like, it's all inter- fuck with, interlinked. Yeah, it's your brain saying, hey, this is how we fucking survived to get here. This is what we've been doing. Hey, we've been okay to this point, right? We're, 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 we're still alive, right? All right. We've just exactly. Gotta, hey, keep it going. Hey, the, 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 uh, the fucking, uh, what do they call it? The, um, God damn it. The, um, what's the word for the amusement park ride? I can't. That's on the fucking tip of my tongue. The fucking. Space um, Mountain? That's one of them. What, what, what are those motherfuckers called? Um, um, God damn it. The roller coaster. Fucking sure. roller coaster. The fucking roller coaster. Hey, your brain's like, hey, this is roller coaster we've been, we've been taking. Hey, everything's okay. Right? Why, why you need to go anywhere else? And you, you keep going on the highs and the lows of it, right? And the, mm-hmm. and the spinny shit and the fucking flip de doos and whatever the fuck. Hey, but you're still alive after all of it, right? You might have gone a multitude of directions, but it's what you did to survive. Yeah. But like, there's better fucking. There's better fucking ways. And George, I I want to I want to do a part two of this shit because like, sure. I feel like pe- people need to process this shit like I have. <laughs> <laughs> this got way deeper than I thought it was going to be in the best of in the best of ways though. And like I I even like I go I go through my podcast, especially the ones where it's like I've had Steve Maeda on right like twice and yeah. Keith Paolino on and like these guys like I've gone through those episodes and like I have like literal like notes where i'm just like fuck like there's some there's some key gems in this bitch and and i need to apply this shit to my life <laughs> but uh but yeah i feel like i need to do that with this episode and i hope people do but and, and i want to do this again i want to do this part two with you as i have a little bit more time to to wrap up this book and like see i think relationships and dating in the this it's like this scientific fucking light at this point man like more sciencey and not like I'm a dating coach and like I think I I think of this when it's I don't know that that sounds horrible but like I I feel like this is more like fucking what's the word I'm looking for man like this is some real shit this is, it goes back to childhood and shit and like yeah some real science yeah it's like one of the things we're fortunate about in the current space we live in like the current time we live in is when it comes to love and and relationships. We don't have all the answers, guaranteed. We don't. But these things are not mystical. They're not some esoteric thing that exists in the world that we have no bearings about and we just think, we just know, oh, shit. People, dude, before I got into any of this, my perception of love and attraction was somebody either is attracted to you or not. And it just happens. And it's just some sort of like (laughs) mystical thing that just happens and there's no control over it and that's what you're taught as a fucking kid right right what they show in the movies right and and to be honest that's how most people still think of it and they don't understand the science and and they don't understand but here's here's the kind of like the flame of hope that you need to take away from all of this shit which is the reason you do the things you do the reason you're getting the relationships you're getting all of that shit is not because of you, number one. It's not because of some fate that you have that you have no control over. That's number two. It's not because women are secretly scumbag and you know evil creatures that take advantage of men. It's not that. It's not because you're not Brad Pitt. It's not that. It's because when you understand your patterns and why those patterns are the only way you can out of a million combinations come to the point that you're actually at in your life, Mm -hmm. then you will recognize what's getting in your way from having the thing that you want because you are a creature of patterns. The fact is Mm -hmm. I can jump on a call with someone in, and in about five minutes know exactly why they are where they are. And it's not because I'm psychic nothing particularly special about me other than experience in it, like jujitsu, right? Like if you see Marcelo right. Garcia, right? He's going to, his pattern recognition is just better. So if I fought the guy, he would fuck me up 
in like two seconds flat because his pattern recognition is Floyd just Mayweather. Superior. Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. Perfect example. And that's what it is. It's it's being able to see those patterns. And I see those patterns and I can point them out to you and I can tell you exactly where the where the trails are, where the trailheads are, because I've seen them in myself and I've seen them in all the clients I've worked with. And I and we have now science and psychology, not just theorized, but actually grounded science and psychology that supports and is cohesive with these things. And it's not just a thing of some loser guy on a fucking, what was it called? The news forum. What were they called? News forums? Uh I fucking forgot what they were. There used to be these things on email that you could get like into these groups and they would, ah, fuck. I don't know. Bulletin board. That'll do. A bulletin board. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, what you got to realize is, this whole fucking dating obsession, like this whole pickup thing came about with a bunch of guys who probably in high school didn't attract the women they wanted and didn't have the popularity they wanted being on forums on the internet on, on, on the early days of the internet or bulletin boards before the internet experimenting with shit and just trying shit and then relaying back what they did and then building on that and eventually creating models and mythology around what it takes to attract and date and relate to women. And that mythology has grown from generation to generation. So like Steve Maeda is probably like first generation, Mark Manson, all those guys, they're probably first generation or even like second ish. I don't know. Um, First or second. And then like someone like myself is third. And now you've got like fourth, fifth or sixth generation dudes. But it's this mythos that started back there. That's kind of carried on. And then right. just accepting that mythos and just being like, oh, it works. And who like creating this kind of idea that these things are real when they're just a model. They're just a model, right? Like when, when we say, oh, you got a Kino Escalate or shit like that. Fuck, dude, man. I haven't heard that in years. Uh, yeah. There's guys, <laughs> there's dudes that like, the, the fact is you don't need to do that. There's, it's, an, it's not necessary. It's not absolute. In fact, I know... One of, one of the best Australian d- dating coaches who funnily enough, isn't a dating coach anymore. He never used to touch women as a part of approaching. I and mean, he, he attracted hundreds of them. So like all this shit is really good, but what I'm trying to get at is there's this mythos and these models that have come from, you know, men going out and trying all different shit and seeing what works and creating ideas and frameworks around it. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of propagated on and on and on and on into new generations. But as far as it comes to relationship and dating and all these things, there's some really good stuff in there. No doubt about Mm -hmm. it. Like there's some really good components in there that you have to understand, but it's not just some like esoteric thing or just evolutionary biology that you can just be like, Oh, you know, women are just into guys with who are alpha males who have six packs and you know, all this bullshit A million dollars yeah, A million yeah. dollars and women are only attracted to money. It's so it's far more complex because the thing about dating and relationships, there's two components that make it different to other relationships that we have. One is that dating and related and relationships generally make us vulnerable because the reason we want that person is that they actually make us vulnerable and we want to be vulnerable with them because that's what makes that connection special and different from just a friendship or family or whatever, like that you can be your total self with that person and you can give your total self. And the second thing is that there's no area that's more likely to kick your insecurities up than dating. So you could say that again, man. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Oh, these girls is drama. These girls is drama, bro. Let me tell you. <laughs> you hear about it all the time, but let me tell you. Um, yeah. I, I think that's a phenomenal way to put it. And I definitely think that's a great way to, kind of wrap up exactly 
what I what I was talking about, man. It's adding psychology into into this and and going deeper and, and understanding. And I'm listen, man. I'm happy I go down this rabbit hole. I'm happy I met fucking Steve. And I'm happy I fucking met you. I'm happy I got this book. I'm happy we can have this conversation even about this. If for me, it's just scratching the surface about shit like this. And I'm happy to do all this. Like I've been dating for less than a year, man. And like, just trying to like, Hey man, I'm just trying to get it right. I'm just trying to get it as best as I can where it's me putting my best foot forward and trying to understand the people that like I'm wanting to have connections with. And, and even if I don't get it right all the time, I feel like, we don't do that often. A lot of people don't, just don't do that often enough, man. And uh, hopefully they're able to hear this, they're able to see this. When we come on the part two, we'll go even more balls deep and, and go in on a lot more for shit. Sure. And I'll probably have a lot more ideas and concepts. But for the meantime, George, man, where can people find you? Where can, where can people look you up? Where can they get in touch with you? Blast yourself right now. This is, this is your time to take over my show real quick, man. Sure. So the, the best place to find me is my um, community, my free community on Facebook, which is um, it, you can basically find it facebook.com slash group slash the integral alpha, T H E integral alpha. Uh, and also the integral alpha.com. Uh, I'm pretty active in there. There's always great stuff in there. And um, yeah, you know, if, if you come through, through those channels, let me know that it was from the podcast. That would be great. And you'll see that there's a whole, whole different world out there in terms of understanding this stuff that doesn't require you running away from yourself. And that's really, mm -hmm. the, that's really the message I'm trying to get across. It's a, it's, it's a couple of things. It's don't look at modern dating as some war zone, have fucking fun, enjoy it. Like dating is fun. Women are fun, have fun with it mm -hmm. and don't turn it into a fucking war zone. Two is don't ever think dating or a relationship is going to solve your problems or mean that you can escape yourself. If anything, it's just going to amplify that shit. And three, since you are taking the steps to work on this area of your life, the beauty, I, I've got to give credit to pick up for one thing. What the game did more than anything is give guys hope and a goal that was grandiose enough that it got them to do things that they never thought they were capable of doing. Huh? So if you go through this dating process and it gives you that hope and that grandiose like goal that sh like gives you, gives you the carrot on the stick that gets you doing things that you never thought you'd ever do. And it betters your life. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And that's really what I'm trying to get across because I'm sick of the red pill shit. I'm sick of the pickup stuff. I'm sick of working with guys who can meet countless women, but can't get into relationships that last. And then think, and then they're not willing to even look at themselves because of it. And I'm just sick of all the good guys who, well, I'll put it to you straight. What's the opposite of pickup? Not picking up. There's nothing. There's no, nothing. Like, there's no alternative. So that's the channel that guys, get streamed down is the pickup right otherwise it's like personal development or spirituality or whatever but but i guess what we need to start looking at is like not so much pickup but like a dating a path with approaching dating that actually allows us to be prepared for the relationships we want and choose when we're ready for them mm. That would be very helpful. <laughs> I'm working on that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, I can't wait. Yeah, I know you are. Uh, you're starting a book, right? Like that's. Uh, that's yeah, that's very grand. Speaking of grandiose, I, I, I'm a big fan of that. Um, but yeah, man, that's that's exciting in and of itself. Uh, and George, you have a, like a show too, right? That you do. No, not at the moment. I'm considering okay. it. I'm actually there's a couple of things in the works that I'm working on. Um, I like to think all my Facebook lives that I do are shows. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. interested <laughs> on, the, on there. No, no shows at the moment. Uh, just kind of working on getting the message out wider, working on the book. You know, the book is, it ba well, fuck, you know, we covered a little bit of ground here. It basically covers everything, my whole entire philosophy. Um, yeah, so just plugging away at that. I probably will consider a podcast or something in the future, but 
but right now we've got enough going, enough things churning over and, and, and yeah, just keep working away at it. And if I feel like a podcast, if I feel like there's a podcast that I can do with an angle that's worthwhile, that's, that's not just going to be another, you know, dating thing or another pickup thing or another relationship thing. I'll consider another of the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's enough people sharing the same old shit. So <laughs> not mad yeah. at it. Not, not mad at it. Everybody. I uh, thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Go ahead and follow the podcast unfiltered bachelor iTunes stitcher anywhere podcasts are. That's where the show is. You can follow it also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can follow me money, Blake, Weather, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Tell your friends to tell their friends so they can tell their friends so they can get better at dating. And even if you're not dating, hopefully this is just some eye-opening words of just advice or eye-opening words and just some theories that will help you in your relationship. I just appreciate y'all tuning in. I hope y'all live in y'all best life. And thank y'all for tuning in, whether it's morning, evening, afternoon, whenever you listen to this. Thank you so much. And until the next time, we'll see you. Peace. They drew me in so close in the head.